So I'm going to give this a few more minutes here. And I will tell you, I was almost just not here because I was out walking. It's dark here now in Maine, uh, which is breaking my heart, but it is what it is. And um, fortunately, although I was walking without a light, uh, noticed there was activity on the road in front of me. So I did stop long enough for the skunk to cross the road, uh, turn my, my, uh, my phone on the flashlight and recognize that I was not alone on that road. And if I'd gotten sprayed by a skunk, I tell you, I'd have canceled on you. Uh, never heard, happened before, but I hear they sting terribly. All right, so we are two minutes in and I'm going to start now and start by thanking you for coming tonight. I'm sorry I couldn't do the politics chat earlier, but we're really ramping up now the, the, the media for the book. And it's really exhausting actually to concentrate that hard for that long. And what it means is that my time's really short right now. But um, so first of all, thank you for coming. But I want to start with why I wanted to do these Facebook videos, because I know a lot of you were disappointed that in this first set of live events that I'm doing around the country. The tickets were very limited, um, although they, they got bigger and bigger venues. They went to the, the largest places they could for the, the bookstores that were handling these, um, these book talks. And I just want to reiterate that the first month that I'm traveling around the country is uh, is part of a tour that's put together by, a, a, by, the, by the, the publisher, not by me. I'm going to continue to tour for the next year. So there may very well be an occasion in which I'm in your neighborhood. And we have not announced any of those tours yet, although I have seen people starting to trade information that they've heard elsewhere about where and when I'm going to be. So you may still, still get to do this live, but, but I wanted to do this Facebook video, there'll be another one tomorrow at noon for people who are in different time zones that make it hard to get here in this moment, simply because this book is really your book. Um, and, and I wanted to start by reading the dedication. And, and mind you, I'm sorry, here's the book. I can't actually see if you're getting to see this. Um, yeah, I'm saying this is the book. I got copies of it um, a couple days ago. And so nobody's nobody except reviewers have yet seen this. And um, I wanted to read to you. Isn't it great when you go to book reading and people read their books? I'm thinking, I know how to read. Just tell me something that's not in the book. But in this case, I wanted to read this dedication to you because I think you'll understand why I wanted to do this Facebook video before I did anything else. This is the dedication. To the people who have joined me in exploring the complex relationship between history, humanity, and modern politics, this book is yours as much as it is mine. And I meant that. This book really was, and I'll explain to you how it came to be, but this book really is, um, is all of ours. It was my fingers on the keyboard, but it is a reflection of where we have been together over the past four years. So um, so let me explain where the book came from, first of all. Uh, it was intended originally to answer a lot of the questions that people ask every week when I do the, the, the politics chat, chat videos, like um, what is a Southern strategy? How do the parties switch sides? What is the electoral college? Um, uh, what's another one? What does liberal mean? What does fascism mean? You know, all the things that bubble up all the time and to sort of explain in a, in a really sort of clear way how we got to where we are. And so I envisioned it as being a series of short essays that you could read before bed. I wanted them to six or seven pages. Maybe you can read more in bed than I do, but I tend to fall asleep like a, like a dead thing. So I wanted them short and I wanted them to, to explain, you know, sort of how we got here in this moment, which I talk about a lot, the changes in the Republican Party and Barry Goldwater and all that. And then sort of where here is, which has been the last six years, uh, beginning with the election or the, the candidacy of former President Trump, and then uh, have a section on how we get out of here. So I sat down to write these chapters and they I, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the process of writing them and why some things were easier and th some things were harder. But I wrote the 30 chapters there because they're short. It's the book is, I don't know, 250 pages or so. Um, let's see, just out of curiosity, the book is 200 and 
53 pages. So it's 30 chapters, but it's not, you know, gone with the wind, right? So, um, so I wrote them and I put the book aside because I got married. That's, you know, I was on a mad dash to finish the, the book uh, in order to have some time to celebrate last September when Buddy and I got married. So what was interesting about that writing was that it was different than in a number of ways than anything I had done before in that I typed and I wrote and I, I would write the book all day. So I'd get up in the morning and I would write the book during the day. And then I would try and get some exercise because if I don't get exercise, I don't sleep. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And then I would write the letters all night. And so I didn't pay any attention to the, the chapters I wrote. It was really just cranking it out. You know, I've got to write this one today. I've got to write this one today or oh, this week. I think I tried to do two a week, something like that. I didn't always make it, but that's what I tried to do. And then I would put them aside and not look at them because I figured if I started looking at them, I would never be able to move forward again. And that's kind of a, a truism in writing. Someday, if you guys want me to do a, a something on, the, on writing and, and how to write, I'm happy to do that. But so I'd put them aside. And then I went and got married and took some time off from the manuscript. And when I went back to the manuscript and read it through cover to cover, which is, you know, or, or file to file, which is what you're, what you should do. You, you write a manuscript and you leave it in a drawer. Stephen King says there's no better editorial tool than a drawer. You leave it in a drawer and then you come back to it and you read it through and see what you've got. And what, what came out to me when I read what, what I had written was that it was not the book I thought I was writing at all, that it had a life of its own. And, and I think I wrote somewhere that it was almost as if the chapters had been talking to each other while I wasn't looking the same way actually that my, my, uh, my students do. And they often come up with ideas that, that, I mean, I guess I had something to do with, but that are, really they have a life of their own and and if you listen to what they have to say it's it's a new creation and that's what this felt like so when i read through the chapters i was shocked at what jumped out to me and what jumped out to me was a pretty sophisticated story about how democracies die and how why they die and how you can get them back and there are many books that that are that talk about things like that. But what jumped out to me in what I had written was that the way that authoritarians gain power is through their use of language and crucially their use of history and their understanding of history. And so what the book ended up being was not only a trip through all of American history. So the first section starts in 1937 with uh, this document called the, the Conservative Manifesto. And the first 10 chapters go from 1937 to 2016 or thereabouts. I don't really remember. I haven't read it since, since I sent off the final copy. And then the, 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 the middle section goes from the election of Donald Trump to uh to i think shortly after biden takes office or maybe a little bit further maybe the first two years of biden but then the third section goes back to uh, colonial america and the entire end of the book is a trip through american history from uh, the arrival of europeans on the north american continent uh through and of course th these chapters are only six six pages long so they're short through uh the present and what the argument of the book is, and I don't think you have to know this, I think you can read the book as, as, as the essays it was intended to be. I think it hangs together that way. Uh, but there is an argument that the way we talk about things, first of all, really matters, but also the way we remember our history really matters. Because this idea that somehow there is a perfect past that we can return to if only we follow certain divine laws or universal laws that, that nature has laid down. The idea that there is a perfect past is a theory that suits authoritarians because they can argue to their followers that we can go back to a perfect time in which those followers are more important than they feel they are in the present. If only we follow these certain rules that those people, our enemies, are refusing to follow. But what emerges if you look at American history is that democracy, a democratic history, and, and I mean a small d democratic history, is always about change. 
it's always about individuals trying to make the principles of the Declaration of Independence come true. The idea that we should all be treated equally before the law and that we should have a say in our government, both things that are that are promised in the Declaration of Independence. And, and what the book ultimately argues, and this is what I hadn't seen when I wrote the chapters, is that the reason that the United States has managed to preserve its democracy at times that other countries were not able to, like for example, during the rise of fascism, which was very strong in America too, by the way, in the 1920s and the 1930s, um, is because marginalized Americans, people of color, women, black Americans, have kept in front of us all the time the principles of the Declaration of Independence. They have insisted on inclusion in that in those principles, even when they were otherwise excluded. And because of that, from the very beginning, from before the Constitution was even written, they have argued that they need to be included in those promises. And because of that, they have expanded our democracy. So the book ended up, I mean, that's the cheat sheet for what's in this book. And I, I'm one of those people who thinks that it's okay to know what the argument of the book is because the journey of how I make that argument, I think still remains a, a good read, an interesting read. So the book ended up being a very different kind of book than I have ever written before, except to some degree how the South won the Civil War. So this is my seventh original book. There's also an edited book in there that everybody forgets, but I've, I'm kind of sweet on it. It's, it's a specialized book. Um, but my other books, like, um, and I'm going to use as an example here, well, you could you could take um, either my second book on Reconstruction or my fourth book on the Wounded Knee Massacre. Things happen. You're explaining how things happen. And, and it's not like you're going to be surprised um, by the way that the book turns out, because it's not like you could suddenly say, oh, look, there wasn't a massacre. I mean, you know what's going to happen. So people asked how the process was different here. In those books, the way that the way that I write a book, and I'm going to talk a little bit on how I, I work, but it fits here. The way I write a book is that I, I think about it for a long time for a long time, for years. So, you know, I may never write another book after this. I'm 60 and I confess I'm pretty tired these days, but, but I also won't promise that I won't write another book because I'm thinking about it already. And when I mean thinking about it, I mean very frequently throughout the day, I'll be playing with ideas. And I'll maybe pick up a book, not for a long time right now, I'm incredibly busy. But, you know, I got obsessed with Martin Van Buren the other day. May, many people noticed that I was talking about Martin Van Buren while I'd been poking around in his autobiography that day. And I guess I tweeted about it. So normally for a book, I think about it for a long time. And once I see that moment, and, and you can see the moment when you write a book. So a great example of this is for, for example, when I wrote the Wounded Knee book, um, it's called um, uh, Wounded Knee, Party Politics and the Road to an American Massacre. You know, I was telling the story and it, it just wasn't, I mean, it, the, it, it was happening and things were happening, but there wasn't a reason yet. And what, what historians do is we don't just tell you what happened, we tell you why it matters. And there were there are many reasons that different things matter. There are certainly many reasons that the Wounded Knee Massacre mattered. But the reason that it mattered for for me, I hadn't found yet. And there was one day when I was reading through my material and looking at things, and I recognized that there's, and I talk about this a lot, that the Republican Party expected to win the midterm elections of 1890 and to be able to put in place a really strong pro-business um, guardrails that couldn't be broken. And because of a number of things, they had really messed that up. And so they lost control of the House of Representatives by a margin of two to one. And I was looking at whether or not they'd won the Senate. And I recognized all of a sudden, I remember it, I recognized all of a sudden the control of the Senate came down to one vote. And then it turned out that the control of the Senate that came down to that one vote was the vote from South Dakota, which is where the Wounded Knee Massacre is gonna happen. And then I realized that that one seat was was from the beginning marred by um, by corruption. I mean, there, there were ballot boxes broken open. Nobody was saying it was a clean election, let me tell you. And and then I realized that the president had written a telegram telling the, the military 
to provision itself in South Dakota, because in those days, it was the legislature that would decide who the next senator was, and the legislature wasn't going to meet till January. And of course, all this is happening in November. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my Lord, this is a fight over control of the U.S. government. It's not just about the racism that led a certain group of people to fire guns. At stake was control of the federal government. And I remember realizing that, like, what do they say? Light dawning on Marblehead, right? And and I couldn't contain myself. I just couldn't. I, I went, I, I ran out of the house. My kids were in school. It was early afternoon. I ran out of the house and I called a friend and I was like running down the sidewalk. And I'm going, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe what I found. He's a historian of Brazil. And and he was like, ah, oh, that's great. That's great. Because he understood it, even though a historian of Brazil probably didn't know a lot about the Wounded Knee Massacre. So normally when you write a book, you, you get that moment. And once you see it, once you see the book, the writing is nothing. The writing is a question of putting your butt in the chair and typing. But but seeing it is magic. It is truly magical. I can I can tell you that moment for each of my other books. For me, I wrote this book before I had that magical vision. And then I had to rewrite about 80% of it. But as I say, once I had that vision, the 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 rewriting took, uh, well, we got married in, in uh, September. I probably started writing again in October. And the, the final draft went in, um, I don't know, maybe December, maybe not even that late. I mean, once I saw it, I really saw it. So you asked what the difference was of between writing a, a book, the previous books and this book, is that in the previous books, I knew, I, I sat down, I knew what I was gonna write. In this book, I just started to write because I had a deadline and I wanted to get this book out, but then I saw it. And so then I had to rewrite it. But that also means that the book feels very different to me than my other books because it feels like it's it's kind of like this, this child that I had that is behaving in ways I never intended it to, but it's kind of cool you know, what they used to call a sport, you know, uh, something that springs out of nowhere and you don't quite know where it came from. And that is what I meant when I talked about in that dedication about this being belonging to my my people as much as it belongs to me is because clearly when I was answering your questions, we were together creating something entirely new that I couldn't see yet. And and that's really exciting to me that that I find uh, incredibly powerful. And and I will tell you, I, I'm going to tell you, you asked a lot of questions and I'm trying to get them in my usual way, making them a story. Um, uh, I will tell you that when I reread the not the, the when I reread the, the version that is going to become the final version, so not that first draft, but the second rewriting, when I was coming down into the into the the the, the final the final pacing of it, I was sort of horrified by the middle part. It's it's really hard. Like the when you get to how we got to Trump, that's not a happy story. When you get to that part in the middle, when you recognize just how close we came to losing our democracy, man, I, you get about halfway through that and you think, I'm not reading on, I can't handle this. The last section, I promise you, is the redeeming section. So if you can't handle the middle one, close it and go on to the third section, where which I think is the most important section of the book. It's not how we got here or where we are, it's how we get out. I will also point out something about the writing, and that's that it's not accidental that the first two sections, the first section is all about um, basically leaders, white men. The middle section has them, but it's got new voices. And the third section is all those alternative voices. And um, so I'm not going to tell you more that's in the book because you do want to read something. But um, um, but uh, but there's, the, I think, the, the, the overviews in there. Somebody asked, what changed in the research that I did? Um, the 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 big thing for me that i'm sorry in the research that i was doing for the book what made what changed the way the book operated i think that as much as i knew about manafort um paul manafort who was instrumental in donald trump's campaign uh, i did not realize the extent to which there was an overlap from the nixon administration onward between people who are operating in the Republican Party and people who are operating in other countries to overturn their democracies and how many of those techniques came home again. 
And I think the interplay between that and between the the oligarchs after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 and how they began to invest in the United States and in the UK and in democracies to keep their money safe, but then backed political parties that would um, would would keep their money safe rather than um, than using than than raising taxes, for example. I was not aware of of any of that, and that created you know when I when I first wrote, there's a chapter in there on. On, uh, on the fall of the Soviet Union and what money happened after that. And it's a little bit awkward because you feel like you're talking about America and all of a sudden Richardson's talking about, about the collapse of the Soviet Union and money. And at one point, one of my editors said, we don't need this. And I said, we do. You know, I, 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 I hate to, to really say to you this chapter is say, is staying but without understanding this you don't understand why Donald Trump supporters in 2016 wore t-shirts that said let me give you a free helicopter ride which is a reference to um, to Pinochet's goons who threw people out of helicopters and unless you understand the the this fall of the Soviet Union and what that meant for for um, the former Soviet republics and what the money happened, where the money went then, you don't understand Manafort. So so that, I think, was the piece that was most surprising to me. Now, um, I'm going to put a couple of these things. Oh, there's one more I can answer this way. Uh, people asked, how could I write this book as things were changing, which they were every day? And the answer to that is it's not really a book about the present. It is, I did obviously have to change things. So, um, you know, you will find the Dobbs decision. You will find um, what the, the Biden administration did in the first two years. That's somewhere in the book, I'm afraid right now, I don't remember where. So, so when things happened, I did include them. But it's not a book that really depended on what was happening minute to minute. Now, I did write into my contract, there were, there were dates in a contract. I did write into my, my agent wrote into my contract that I had a grace period at the end of the book to make corrections if something huge happened so that, um, so that the book wouldn't be out of date. And I... Um, I don't now remember what I added, but there was nothing. I remember there was the very last minute there was something that um, an editor I'm going to tell you about in a minute um, helped with really at the last minute. But there weren't huge changes that had to be incorporated because nothing, you know, there, there what you know, had there been something extraordinary, it would have been a problem. The The bigger problem for me was that it was never clear to me if I was writing a pean to a democracy that had died, a dirge, if you will, or if I was writing the book about rebuilding that democracy. And that's a hard line to walk. You know, are you saying this is how great it used to be and it fell apart? Or are you saying, oh, look, this is the roadmap for rebuilding our democracy? And of course, it is ultimately titled Democracy Awakening. So you see where I came down on that. But you know, the news would buffet me back and forth and I'd think, oh my God, I got to keep a record for the future of what things were before everything went sour. And then I th would think, oh, I, but I can't be too negative because I also don't want this to be, you know, oh, look at that stupid lady. She thought things were going bad when really it was just the, the pathway to something new. So one of the things you'll find in that third section is a roadmap for democracy. So it wasn't like it was, a you know, one of the things that they say about um about books is that current affairs books are very, very hard to write because they're obsolete usually within a month or two. And I don't write current affairs books, I write history books, which will have, I hope, a longer life. Although that being said, this is really a book about this moment and it, and it fits this moment. It feels like it fits this moment. Um, so, uh, so I didn't really have to worry about things changing in the book so much except on a really small scale, but I did have to worry about which way I felt that things were trending because of course, we don't know how things are trending. We don't know how this is all going to turn out and, and walking that line was a little bit difficult. All right. So, um, so, uh, uh let me, let me go down to this one. Um, People asked how the letters that I write every night influence the book, and they were everywhere. 
because I have to learn so much every night in order to write the letters. And you know, you, you all say to me, how do you know so much? I don't know that much. I know how to do research. So, um, so you know, even things like, um, well, obviously Paul Manafort, but even things like, well, basically everything in the book is stuff I've learned, uh, except the history, which I know pretty well because I'm a historian. Um, and, and just to, to be clear here, the difference between a journalist and a historian is we're trained incredibly differently. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But journalists tell you what happened. Historians tell you why it matters. And that's a really big difference that matters, of course, in journalists today. And I'll talk about that in a minute, too. All right. So the other things you asked about how do the letters influence the book that I want to that I want to emphasize is that I've just thrown out the name of Manafort. I've thrown out the name of an editor who helped a lot. And I, I should have asked ahead of time if I could say people's names. I'm going to I'm going to maybe keep an eye on this. Um, I, I, I mean, it's not a secret to me, but I but. Me saying names brings down a lot of attention on people. Um, so I'll hold off and see. Um, um, when I write, for example, about Manafort, um, about Paul Manafort, there's actually somebody listening now, or possibly, I, I'm not sure the person knows that I was doing this, who contacted me early on when I first started writing about Zelensky and said, you know, you really don't know very much about Ukraine. And my answer was, no, no, let me be clear. I know nothing about Ukraine. I can barely find it on a map. And so for four years, this person who is Ukrainian and incredibly smart has walked me through, you need to read this, you need to read that, you're missing this, um, you're, you're overstating this. And she is not the only one. A lot of people have stepped up to share their, their intelligence with me, to share their understanding of the world with me. And this is across the board, because what I'm really good at, I know American history. You'd have a really hard time stumping me on American history. I might not know the answer, but I know where to find it. But you know, talk to me about maritime law. I don't have any idea about maritime law, except to the degree my mother taught it to me when I was a kid, because we kind of had to know some stuff about it. You know, talk to me about about um, the the uh, the train situation that was going to cause um, such agony in East Palestine, or um, or pretty much anything happening in foreign affairs, or um, the the. I mean, I, I, I don't need to go on. The, the point is that lots of people help me out all the time by saying to me, you don't understand this. You're not doing this right. Have you seen this? And that's not, they're not, that's not criticism. That's crowdsourcing. That's helpful. And then there are a couple of people, no, more than that, a number of people who send me information every day about things I might not have seen. And there are a number of people who are very good. They're all specialists in one thing or another. And then there's one person who's just really, really, really good at scanning the news all the time and saying, you know, maybe you didn't see this from Stars and Stripes. And, and it's true, I can't do it all every day. Um, so how the letters influence the book is that those people didn't write the book for me at all. And they didn't actually read the book for me at all. Um, early on, one of them read the book later on because there's two other people that are mentioned in this book that, that need to be mentioned here. Um, but I learned, I've learned so much doing these letters because people have helped me that that's how the letters really influence the book. Now, that being said, there were two people who are on board every night with the letters and who are on, were on board with this book that um, are phenomenal at what they do for incredibly different reasons. One of them um, has an eye for for editing, for not not for editing, for 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 reading, like literally nobody I've ever seen, and I can't see if what I have written is good or not. I I can't. I mean, I what I think is great, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily cotton to, and what I think sucks turns out is often pretty good. And this person has an absolutely flawless eye and is not trained in the work at all, but can look at it and say, this is fabulous. This, you, you better take back to the drawing board. She read it and made comments about what worked and what didn't, which was incredibly helpful. And then a number of you know that every night there is somebody who copyrights, and, and, and copy, copy, copy edits. 
there is the woman who the person I shouldn't say the person because I don't have permission to say names but the person who reads me every night reads me every night to say this works this doesn't and and you have her to thank for the the piece that you all loved on September 17th I guess it was which I thought was so bad I was not going to post it and she said you never know what's good this is terrific please post it and I did and of course she was right and I was wrong um the the then there's my copy editor like every night there is a woman a person who reads me and copy edits me and she is phenomenal she is truly phenomenal and she copy edited the book and that and by copy editing most people think copy editors they think they change commas which by the way this person does because i can't do a copy to save my life but um but this person also made word changes, said things weren't clear, fact-checked, just did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. So as I say, this book really belongs to a lot of people and not just me. All right, so um, so people asked how I work. And again, I'm seeing somewhat in the comments that people are wanting me to talk about politics, which I'm always happy to do on my politics chats. But and I will do that again. The politics chats aren't going anywhere. And I'm going to pick up the history chats again. I got a bunch of stuff in the works. But tonight is just a book talk for people who don't get to go to the other book talks. And it's more personal, by the way, than the other book talks will be. They will not be personal at all. They'll be about the book. So people asked how I work and how I first of all, you seem to think I get a ton of stuff done. And I want to remind everybody that what you see is the stuff that does get done. And the idea that I do more than everybody else is simply wrong. I do other things than people do, but I don't do more than anybody does. So I was thinking about this. You should see my house. Like, poor buddy. Like, like, I just can't even tell you because I don't have time to do anything, basically. Um, I do the best I can, and he's terrific about it. Uh, I haven't written my Christmas thank you notes from last year. So... Uh, you know, the, I mean, I could just make, make a list up, oh, you know what my hair's in a bun? Cause I haven't had it cut now for, I don't even know how long. Um, I'm finally going to get it cut on Thursday before I go on this book tour. So there's tons of stuff that doesn't get done that you don't see cause you're only seeing what does get done. So when people say, oh, you know, she's superhuman, all that. No, no, I'm not. I'm just not doing all the stuff that everybody else is doing. So don't, don't ever think that somehow, um, you know, you, you should be comparing yourself to what it appears that I get done because I feel all the time like I'm behind. I'm not getting anything done just like you do. It's just that we concentrate on different stuff. So how do I write the letters, people asked. First of all, to write the letters, what I do, first of all, I have to say it's like watching a soap opera in the sense that I know all the characters So by now. So you might look at something and think, who the heck is that senator? I don't do that. I know who the senators are. I know who the, you know, I know all those people. I know who the characters are. I don't have to do any work on that. And so I've already got a leg up on most people. But what, the way my day goes is, as you have asked, is that I, I wake up and the, I hate to say it, and it's not good for my eyes, but the very first thing I do before I get out of bed is I reach for my phone, which I do turn off at night. I turn all the notifications off. Um, I reach for my phone and I, I read through um, Twitter, first of all. And the reason people want to know why, why Twitter is still alive when it shouldn't be is that until very recently, Twitter was the only social media platform that had direct messages. And a lot of people communicate by direct messages. Now, within the last week, another platform has picked up direct messages. I haven't, I haven't tried it yet because I've been busy. But as soon as we can use direct messages somewhere else, that's where we're all going because a lot of journalists, a lot of people who work in this field have group chats where we exchange information. So the first thing I do is I, I open up Twitter and I look at my direct messages and I see what's happened while I was asleep because people are talking about it in, in DMs and then also in on the Twitter feed itself. And that can go as for as long as an hour and a half where I do nothing but I don't read the articles yet. I skim through them to see what's happening in Ukraine, in Russia, in uh, today, Azerbaijan, big deal. Um, 
uh, I mean, I just read through through all the the Twitter uh, the Twitter feeds, and and actually, I do read a lot of um, a lot of stories there, but I try not to because it hurts my eyes. Um, so I read through everything, and then my day, I always try and block off until ten o'clock just to read the news. I get up about seven thirty. I read the news until ten. And then, then I start my day, and my day is full of meetings. And um, actually, it's really sad that I love to research and write, and I get very little time to do that any longer. But my day used to be full of podcasts, which we just ended, um, uh, meetings that I have with people, media um, stuff to do with a book, um, you know, that just that kind of stuff. And then um, whenever I get a break, I continue to read the news. So I'm constantly reading the news, not only the stories, but a story, well, I'll read something and I'll think, oh, wait, 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 I should check this journal because this journal is going to have information about that. Or So I'm constantly flipping back between, because I'm at Boston College, I have access to all kinds of uh, professional journals. And I flip back and forth between that. Or I will read something and I'll think, I don't really know that much about what did I do the other day? I went down a real rabbit hole on um, I read an article about something and I thought I need to know more about this. What was it? I can't even remember now. Um, now it's killing me. But but I spent probably an hour and a half researching this particular aspect of something. And now obviously wherever it is, I don't remember what it was. But but I, every time, whenever I get a spare moment, that's what I do. I dig through um, through information. I, I just sift information. And then once I have that, and once my I try and have my professional day over by four o'clock, it isn't always, but I try to make that happen. Then I do repetitive exercise if I possibly can. And I do that, first of all, because it's important to get exercise. And But I also do it because I find repetitive exercise, walking and kayaking primarily, really seem to free my brain up. And I don't do phone calls on those walks. I don't, um, I don't, I, I, sometimes I go with my sister or a friend, but generally I try to spend some time doing, doing repetitive motion because, because the picture then that I need to write about will become very clear. So that's the other thing that you asked me about is how do I know what to write about in the daily letters? Because what I do is I'm thinking about it is I try and figure out what people are going to want to know in 150 years. And so, for example, um, I don't write about, I, I miss a lot of the noise because unless it looks like it's going to stick, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to make a record of it. So here's a, a tidbit lots of people don't know, and that's that I actually happened to be watching Twitter when news first broke of the si Chinese scientists who said we have a real problem over here. And I saw that and it felt different. And I actually wrote in the letter about it that night. And then I thought, no, my readers are so terribly stressed out. I'm not going to put that in here tonight. It's too much for them. And probably we wouldn't really have a pandemic, right? But I thought, but I'm going to make a note of it. So the notes of that night have the pandemic in it because I figure a historian someday will say, will see that and say, oh, she noticed that night that something was going to happen. And that must have been, must have been about when the story started to break, which is exactly what happened. So, um, so I try and look at it from 150 years in advance. But that being said, um, one of the things that if you watch history enough and if you watch politics enough, I always say it's like for me in my mind, I see it as a stream of cement coming out of the back of a, of a cement truck going into a foundation. If you've ever seen someone pour a foundation, they put up these walls and then they pour the stuff in and it comes down the chute and it just looks like grayish rock and cement and you know gravel and it's just a slurry of, of mud and rock or or whatever slurry of of mud and gravel or whatever they're pouring but if you were looking at that and all of a sudden a children's toy went by you'd notice it and all of a sudden uh, i say a leaping carp went by you'd notice it and that's what I look for. I look for the children's toy or the leaping carp. I look for something that says, this is really important. So, um, so, and, and I don't always call it right, but when something is either part of a larger trend or something that is new and looks big, so tonight there's something that I think looks new and big, um, then I call it out. And that's not what a journalist does necessarily, because a journalist needs to say to you, hey, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. I don't need to do that because that's not my job. My job is to say, 
this happened and this matters and here's why. And so once I have figured that out as I'm walking and really if I don't walk, I have a very, very hard time coming up with a coherent letter. Um, then when I was writing the book, I would go home and we'd have dinner and then I'd write at night, which is why I was always asleep on my desk. Or when I was working, uh, teaching at Boston College, I'm on leave right now, I would do the same thing. I'd teach my whole day and then I'd eat and then I'd go home and I'd fall asleep. Um, and then I would wake up in the middle of the night and write and God bless my copy editor. She was always there. I, you talk about me not sleeping. She truly never sleeps. Um, but that's then how I, I write the letters. And then the, then literally I will sit down and type them. And it's not, it's not easy. It's not fast. There are a minimum, a minimum of three hours. And that's if it's something like on the 17th. And by the way, when I do those pictures, that really is relief for you more than for me, which I think people need because I find writing those, the very short personal captions much harder than writing a letter. They, they take me almost as long. Unless I, unless I just say I'm done. I've, I have, the, the, the last year when I ended up writing Happy Thanksgiving, that took me like four hours. I wrote it again and again and again and again. And then I wrote, finally, I'm like, I have nothing else to say but Happy Thanksgiving. And I'm like, four hours for Happy Thanksgiving. But that's just not the, the way I usually write, those very personal things. So unless it really speaks to me as the Christmas solstice one I always post is does, Every once in a while, there's one that I know what I'm going to say, and then I find a picture to say it. But otherwise, um, those are really hard for me. So the letters take a minimum of, of three hours for something that is personal, as like the, the 17th, the one I did on the 17th was pretty easy because it was about the letters. Um, but they take a minimum of three hours and, and often as much as seven or eight, which is, you know, if you start at seven, that's why I end up writing until three o'clock in the morning because a lot of editing and re-editing and moving and changing and you know by the time i've gone through all that then my copy editor gets it and she um and then she has her own comments on it so it, it takes a long time to write so how does that that's that is literally my day and then i by then buddy has usually gone to bed i try always to get to bed before he goes to bed because there is there is it is horrible to go to bed after he's already up that just feels it just you just feel so stale and used and used up if your day is still ending when your your spouse's is beginning it's just it's just awful so i try and get to bed before he gets up he gets up about 3 30 so i try to get up before because he's a fisherman so he's got to get out so i try to go to bed before he gets up all right how did that compare to writing this book i'm answering the questions here um, that you've asked. And the answer to how to compare to writing the book is really interesting to me because I, I'm at this laptop, which is actually still my loner laptop, um, long story, only because I'm being lazy. The computers work fine. But I killed two laptops in two weeks, if you remember, and switching one to the other is so much work. I kind of got stuck with this one for a while. I will change that. Anyway, speaking of things I never get done, by the way, um, uh, so when I write, I write on this laptop and I try and have a large screen nearby because I have hundreds of tabs open all the time. Um, right now on the on the the one of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, at least twenty-one windows I have open. I have probably on this particular tab. 20 tabs, which is, which I know if you're a computer person, your head just exploded. I'm sorry, this is how I murder laptops, but it's not changing in any great hurry. I clean them out about once every two weeks. Anyway, um, I write the letters on this laptop. And when it's time to write the letters, I write the letters. I just sit down, I start writing. In part, because they're letters. You know, it's like writing a letter to people. Like I, I literally, like, you know, if I were writing this to my brother, what would I say? Or what for my college roommate? I actually envision my college roommates. So I just sit down, I write. And it's hard work, takes a long time, but I just do it. It's a job. You know, it's just, it's it's a habit. It's a, it's a muscle memory. It's, I just do it. What I found fascinating about writing the book was that I was sitting in the exact same chair. Not here, by the way. My house doesn't have cable and I wanted this to be a good, a good quality uh, video. Um, 
in the exact same chair, actually the same chair where I, where I started writing the letters on September 15th, 2019. The exact same chair, the exact same table, the exact same laptop, the exact same music on the radio, the exact same kitchen with yummy foods in it, all that stuff. I did all the same things that you do, could do when you write a book. I'd, I'd clean the house, I'd do laundry, I'd wander around, I'd futz around, I'd pay bills, I'd do everything everything that you do to avoid writing a book. And I found it just fascinating that psychology, and then I do that all day. Sometimes I wouldn't write anything. And you'll see in the acknowledgements, I have thanked a man named um, um, Julian Mortensen, I think is his name, um, who became my writing partner. We met over Twitter and we were both having trouble writing and we would do, we would ask each other to do writing sprints where we would say to each other, um, you know, I'm going to write for 40 minutes and, and then we would join each other and we would sort of make each other accountable to write. I would never have written the book if it weren't for him doing that. And I found it fascinating that the entirely same setup and I couldn't I couldn't perform for the book in any way other than my usual writing, wandering around, screwing around and then finally panicking and writing something. And then I would do whatever I was doing in the afternoon and I'd sit back down and at night I'd be like, do, 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 ding, you know, and it was fine. I, I just thought that was absolutely fascinating. So the writing of the book was really different because the, the book conceptually was not the nitty gritty that I have to do to write the letters. So for example, if I were going to write tonight about um, some meeting at the UN, and I'm not, I don't think. But if I were, I'd have to figure out who was there. That involves looking things up. I'd have to figure out who they were. That involves looking still more things up. That way I would have to figure out who wasn't there. That's more things to look up. You know, just that constant, one of the things I think people like about the letters is they're extremely thorough. You can trust what I say. Um, and if I screw up, I, I tend to acknowledge it. I, I've let something go by recently um, that I need to fix because it's important to people. I actually... <laughs> it was a stupid error, it's a sort of error I make, said that somebody had videotaped um, the the beating of uh, the Reverend Shuttlesworth when he tried to enroll his children at, in school in Birmingham, Alabama in 1957. Of course, there weren't videos uh, there. There, they were. It was a film, and and it was a it, somebody with it was an amateur filmmaker. But and that's really important, especially to people of um, who who do film history. Uh, and it was just a stupid error because I was trying to get the human story right and I got the technological story wrong. I do need to correct that. But I think the reason that you trust me is because I do look things up and you would be shocked at how often we find, and by we I mean either me or the copy editor, um, discovers that a major, a, a major, a major media um, uh, article has has been wrong, has has put something forward that is that is simply wrong. Um, just recently, I had the the distance the 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 border that um, uh, China and India share is a certain number that I had taken from a major uh, media outlet, and somebody read it and said, "I, I hope it, with this number you're including you know the water as well because this is nowhere this is you're you're way out to lunch on this," and the the. The media outlet had taken kilometers as miles, and of course, once you turned it back into miles, it was a really different number than we had. So, um, so we do try to be really thorough and really to catch things. And actually, one of the questions that you asked is um, somebody asked is, "Do I ever second guess myself?" And the answer to that is every single day, every single letter, every single time I hit send. I grit my teeth and think, I wonder how badly I've screwed this up. And it is some nights an incredible struggle to hit that send button um, because, because I know I'm going to make an error, as I do almost every night, a comma in the wrong place or a letter out of place or something like I put a video, whatever it's called, video camera in the hands of a filmmaker and a, you know, the completely out of, out of time. Um, and, and somebody asked, how do you get by that? And I think there's an important distinction between the letters where people seem to have, forgive me when I really screw up because they're somewhat ephemeral. That is, if I really mess up today, I might do better tomorrow. A book's harder. 
and and it has been very hard to let this book go because as i have said i think here is you know, on these videos at times i i originally called this book all i know because it really is the inside of my brain and what my brain has become thanks to you all over the last four years and um and and I wasn't sure it was any good. And my agent would tell you, my editors would tell you, especially the woman who, who reads me and tells me if it's good or not, um, that I have written to people at least dozens of times saying, is it any good? Tell me if it's any good. Is it any good? Have I written anything worth reading? Is it really a book? And, um, and, and I, uh, the reviews of the book so far have been good. And there was one that came in yesterday and I, um, it, it, it made me very happy because it's always nice for people to like what you do, but to have doubts like that and to have someone assuage those doubts in pretty, pretty affirmative terms is a really good thing. So, um, so yes, I second guess myself and that's how it is different between writing a book and writing the letters. Um, so, uh, people asked about this, um, a couple of things here that I can answer pretty quickly. Somebody asked what darlings I killed to write this book. And that's a reference to what another person puts as the, the quality of a book you can tell by the quality of what's on the cutting room floor, because by definition, you can't include everything you wrote. This book was a little bit different in that the writing of it changed so dramatically between the first and the second draft. So it lost chapters. I mean, I threw out entire chapters and added other chapters. Um, but what was really my darling that I lost took a lot of psychological work because one of the things that is important to me is proving that I'm right in terms of making an argument. I wanna have, if you look at my old books, for example, especially my second, my third books, you will see literally paragraph long footnotes. I've looked at this and this and this and this and this and this and this, so you can't argue with this point. And when I first went to write the section on the Trump administration, as I think I said here, I intended the, the chapters to be about three and a half single space pages on Google Docs, which is where, which is where I work. Again, thanks to my copy editor. And the first chapter on the Russia investigation was 27 single spaced pages because I wanted to prove that I knew exactly what had happened. And I wanted for somebody to say, now I understand that letter that they wrote, you know? And the trick was to recognize that that was not this book, that that's in the letters. And this book was intended to do something very different. That is explain why all of those details mattered without putting in the details. And when you, as I say, when you strip out the details of those Trump years, what emerges is not that they're vague, but you know, I don't have, they wrote this letter and then literally I had the steps of who released what letters when, um, because that actually sort of matters, but that's in the letters. Um, and I had to let go of the idea that I was writing a record and had to lose all of that. And believe me, that killed me because because I probably know that better than almost anybody else. And I certainly know the Trump administration better than almost anybody else, the details of it, because I, I read, you know, for many, many, many hours every day. And letting go of that and saying that's not this book, that was hard for me. And those were the darlings that I killed primarily. Now, let me answer just a couple more general questions before I end with some of the more personal questions that you asked. Um, you have asked um, a couple of important things. And the one is fairly easy. People asked how to engage high schoolers in history. And I wanna emphasize that I think history is one of the few fields that is maybe better when you're older. So that being said, I think I think people get interested in history when it is relevant to them. They care about their towns. They care about their families. Talk to them about family history, about cool people in your family, and about stories they can relate to. But I don't know about you. When I was in high school and below, I couldn't understand history because I didn't have any framework for it. So you know, I've used the example before. For me, it's like a light bright. You know, that old toy we that 
people who were lucky used to play with. You can tell I liked light brights and I never had one. Please don't send me light brights. But, um, but if you put in two or three lights, you can't tell what it's a picture of. You gotta have a lot of the lights before you can see that it's a sailboat or whatever. And when you're a kid, you just have no framework for history to do that. Plus the, you're probably more interested in the, in the kid at the table next to you, right? So history is one of those things that doesn't make sense till you have more pieces of it. So for example, for me, I was in, in college, I took an entire course on the French Revolution. We read, I think, probably 13 books on the French Revolution. I wasn't in, it wasn't until I was in graduate school that I realized that the French Revolution came after the American Revolution. Like, that's an important piece of the puzzle, right? But I didn't have that. I, I just didn't have that. So before we get too concerned about, about high schoolers not understanding history, I think the issue is more getting them interested in understanding the passage of time and what that means in a human sense. So, you know, the reason I'm a historian is because of stories that my elders told me and because of novels I read. I mean, James Michener's Centennial blew me out of the water, not because of the history, but because of the human stories in it. And so many of our wonderful novels are about, they're not necessarily real history, but they're not that far from it. And many professional historians will tell you they got into this field um, by, through, um, through uh, historical novels. So that one is important to do, but I worry a lot less about it because think about how many of you are learning history now and everyone says to me, they never taught me this in school. Here's a newsflash, they probably did teach us that in school, but we weren't paying attention. I know that a friend of mine might be listening and we had a longstanding joke about the Santa Fe Trail. And um, I was literally writing my last book uh, how the South won the Civil War before I truly understood what the Spanish, what the the Santa Fe Trail was. So you know, I think that that it's one of those things that we can do the best we can, but you have to have some knowledge under your belt before you can really get into history. Um, but another question that you've asked about is how do we get news um, news outlets to to be more fair, e more evenly handed in the way they talk about history. I'm sorry, not about history, about the news today. And I would urge you to put pressure on them to do that. And that's not to put pressure like, um, you know, the, the, the movement conservatives did in the 1980s to say, you know, we don't want to operate in facts. We only want to operate in opinion and, and in pushing our ideology, but rather to, to ask them and you know and really call it out when for example headlines like last night the day before i'm recording this on september 19th when they talked about the fact that the biden administration got the release of five people who were uh false uh, un, you know unjustly imprisoned in iran got them released because releasing hostages has been a priority for this administration, and that made 35 that they had gotten released. That took years of negotiations, and the right wing is misinterpret is is deliberately saying that this we made a payment. That's not at all what happened. Um, the the uh, six billion dollars that South Korea, the Republic of Korea, was supposed to pay to Iran for oil had never been delivered because of conditions that were unique to the Republic of Korea. Similarly, money like that had been spent from other countries during the Trump administration, but it couldn't have been during um, because of things that were happening in, in the Republic of Korea. And that money has now been released to Qatar for it to be able to oversee that use of money for um, humanitarian aid. And that's just not what was being represented. So the, the newspapers reported that, a number of newspapers reported that as Biden under fire for, um, you know, for hostage release or something like that. And th that platforms a lie by saying that, that, you know, by implying that that criticism is fair. I mean, you can certainly have articles about that criticism, which I think is important to do, but to report that as if it is news is a disservice and you should call it out and calling it out may not make a difference, but at least will, um, will make it known that they're, and, and, and I will say CNN, by the way, within the last few weeks has been featuring some really good articles that call it like it is. And I've been trying to highlight those on social media. So I think you should call that out. Uh, the, the other thing that I want to um, 
call out here. You've asked about how do we stop book banning, which is a similar part of this, I think. You show up at local, um, at local meetings, at local elections, at local school board meetings and speak up um, because many of the people who are going to those school board meetings and taking them over are not uh, even part of the community. So I will talk more about that in other places, but I, I do, you've asked um, some, some questions, uh, personal questions that I wanted to answer very briefly here, because I want to get home and have something to eat, and, and I know you want to go as well. You've asked how my life has changed since doing these letters, and how Buddy's life has changed, because we got married. We uh, started dating in July of 2016, so this has been our lives. And he, of course, is a, a, a commercial fisherman on the coast of Maine. This is not necessarily what he was signing up for when he finally asked me out in 2016. And um, the, the answer to the first question of how my life has changed is that, um, actually, let me start with how his life has changed because I can end with how my life has changed. His life has changed, of course, um, because he is so much more out in the world, because people pay so much more attention to him. He also has a very busy career of his own though. So when people say, you know, I'm so busy, that's very true. He's very busy as well. So in the summer months, he literally gets up at 3.30 at in the morning. He's gone before sunrise. And then he is um, working with the guys uh, in the harbor until at least seven o'clock. And then he runs a restaurant. So, um, uh, the, so he's usually not home by until about eight o'clock. So it's not like he's sitting home pining for me. And, and I think he really loves um, all the people we get to meet and all the places we get to go. And he, he certainly, you know, I'm always saying you don't have to come. And he's always like, no, 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 I love this. So I think he actually really enjoys it, although I shouldn't speak for him. Um, certainly he is only supportive of me and in the dedicate and not the dedication in the acknowledgements you will see that there is um the the acknowledgement that i could never do this without him i i really couldn't every time i start to go bonkers over it he's just there being solid and principled and honest and smart and interesting and um and really just holding me up so that's how his life has changed how my life has changed is, first of all, you have to remember that because of all this happening in the way it did, especially during COVID, um, which started very shortly after I wrote the letters, my intellectual life is experienced through this screen for the most part. Um, so my day-to-day -day life didn't change really at all for a very long time because I would write letters to my friends. It just happened that more and more and more people read them. And that's still what I do every night. Somebody said to me, what do you do? How do you write to a million, more than a million people every night? And the answer is, I don't. If you start to think about how many people are out there, or if I start to think, oh, what's this person gonna think? Or, oh, what's that person gonna think? It's absolutely paralyzing. So every night I write to my friends and um, tell them what I think is important. And I also write to that graduate student in 150 years and tell her uh, what I think she needs to know. So in terms of that, my life hasn't changed. What has changed is how much I am aware of how many wonderful people there are in this country and in other countries as well who care deeply about American democracy but who also care about each other. And one of the things that, if there's one thing that bothers me, it's the degree to which people say to me, I'm all alone. I, there's nobody who thinks like me. You know, what can I do? What are people gonna do to me? What's the government gonna do to me? And I always think, and sometimes I write back, and sometimes I say, you know, in this community that we have built here on Facebook, and it is not just me, it is the woman who awards, who gives awards every night. That wasn't my idea. I didn't even know it was happening for months, but it made there start to be a competition and people started to play around and they, they waited for the letters to drop. And it's the people who support each other and who have become friends. You know, when I'm out in Seattle, I'm meeting up with three dear friends, two of whom are, I met in this community. Um, I think that one of the things that has totally surprised me is the 
the degree to which there is this large group of people who are really decent, wonderful, smart, interesting, fun people who have not had a platform for a really long time. And what I have come to believe is that I am, I say, as I say, the coffee pot around which this community has developed. And I am incredibly honored by that. I am incredibly honored by being able to be part of that community. And to do that at a time when I'm also able to keep the record of what's happening in the United States. That, finally, somebody asked, what is my dream career? When I was a kid, from the time I was little, second grade, I remember saying this to my teacher, all I want to do is teach and write. That's all I want to do, I want to teach and write. And if you think about what I do now at 60 years old, I am a teacher and a writer for an extraordinary community. And I have a unique position in the United States in this moment. And I have a neat, unique position in American history. And I am not exaggerating when I say I am the luckiest woman in the world. And I never forget that. And I never forget that that's because of you. So if you wanna buy the book, that's fine. I, honest to God, don't care um, because it's really, in a way, my love letter to you all, and and I hope you like it. So I guess I have nothing really more to say except thank you for being here, and uh, for those of you who are interested, I will um, uh, do another one of these at noon for people, uh, tomorrow for people who were not able to make it tonight or who might want to hear a different version of this tonight, tomorrow. And I'll see some of you on the road and I will see you tonight. And I, I will probably write short tonight because I'm very tired. And, um, and we'll, I'll figure out how we're going to manage to do the politics chats, which are fun for me as well as for you going forward through this first leg of the tour. So thank you for being here and I will See you again soon. Take care.